Our speaker tonight, uh, Sandaya um, Sahari, right? Am I correct? Sandia says Chaudhry. Pretty Sandia. good. Sahari. Okay, <laughs> Sahari, I'm sorry. All right. Um, she's from Texas. So everybody knows that already, obviously. But most important thing, I, mean, I was reading her, the, her information. She says right here, she's a hands-on investor operating with a strong focus on asset management at the honeymoon's over to add value to the two different customers in apartment investing, who are the limited partners as well as the multifamily residents, right? And that's what I like, right? Because she's not just about money. She's about helping create a community. And that's what, as multifamily investors, that's what we need to think about, the community that we, that we, are, we, are, we, are, we are growing, right? We're creating, we're creating a community. So um, I appreciate you coming on taking time from your family and time out your busy life. And without further ado, please take the, take the, I gave you the co-host if you want to present, that's great too, right? Um, once again, Sanaya, thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces and a lot of you have a lot of experience. So feel free to chime in when you can add to the discussion and certainly um, afterwards as well. So is everyone able to see this uh, presentation? Yes. It's pretty straightforward. It's underwriting and asset management, but in today's environment, what are we doing slightly differently? So we're still doing a lot of the basics, but we're just digging deeper into a few more things to be extra cautious uh, considering the environment we're in. Um, so a little bit more about me. I'm a Dallas resident for over 32 years. I'm originally from India, from South India, from a place called Chennai or Madras, which is a coastal big city. Um, so I'm used to the big city noises and living in an apartment, et cetera. So I don't know what that's like. I am now an apartment syndicator and I'm a general partner in about seven deals, 160 million worth of assets in DFW. And they're all located within 30 minutes of where I live. And that's the big uh, point I'm going to, I guess, emphasize quite a bit is that I know my local market. I may not know other markets, but this is my market, and that's why I like to do deals uh, close to where I live. I am a limited partner in 23 different deals, some of which have gone a full cycle, and that's over $300 million worth of assets. I did try one in a couple of deals in Arizona and then one in Florida just to see how they do, but predominantly everything else is in Texas. Um, I have a background in electrical engineering, like most Asian geeks, uh, you know, we're taught to do well in school, get good grades, get a degree, get a job, work that job till you retire and then die. So that was a grand plan that got changed after about 12 years in the corporate world, had kids, um, traded stocks for over 20 years, loved it. Uh, because of my MBA, I belonged to several uh, investor clubs and we traded stocks together for a while. Uh, when I had children so I could dictate my schedule, but then now I'm in full-time in multifamily. Um, and I found multifamily as a way for me to find some tax advantages. Um, I completely skipped the single family route because I just didn't have the background to do the four T's, tenants, toilets, trash, and termites. Uh, just didn't see the margins and, you know, a few hundred dollars in managing single family rentals. So I went from zero to um, 86 doors as my first multifamily from joining the Summer Rock program from which I see at least half a dozen people in this audience. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why due diligence is extremely important when it comes to underwriting a deal. And by due diligence, I don't mean just the physical due diligence. Um, I mean also the financial due diligence. Um, and then, you know, asking different people, all your support team, because multifamily is a team sport, making sure your lending, your legal, your property management, everyone is involved and is helping you put your numbers together, avoid any major pitfalls uh, in transactions. Uh, what are things that you can negotiate in a PSA? Um, you know, obviously a broker is never going to tell you uh, all the negative things in a deal. So it's very important not to look at the offering memorandum and take it at face value, but rather make a list of things that say, okay, I need these five things from this OM uh, offering memorandum to actually be true for this deal to work and to make sure I verify those details by asking the broker questions, doing it when you're tour of the property, et cetera. Um, so location as usual in real estate is everything. So I hope you love these uh, beautiful pictures. As you can imagine, the one in the bottom is from Houston, and uh, the other one is uh, just a big fire, you know, that can make a dif difference, right? Did you know that uh, 
you have newly renovated apartments because there was a fire there before. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Could be, right? Either. What do you think? I'd love to hear your uh, comments in the chat box. Let's say an apartment building, like one of 19 buildings in this apartment complex was down from a fire and now it's been rebuilt and now you've got all these newly renovated units. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And why do you think so? Right? Okay, nice to see some answers in the chat. That's right, insurance is going up, you got it. It's good that you have new units because now you can lease them at a different rate but your insurance is definitely going up. Um, in terms of location, I think most of you know this, but I'm gonna repeat. You need to be in a landlord friendly state. And even within that state, you need to know your little blue and red pockets, et cetera, from a business perspective. How you vote is up to you. But when you're running a business and you can't evict tenants, it's gonna be a problem if you're in the rental business. So definitely you need to know where you're located and what the local laws are, what the county judges are like, uh, what is your plan if you have a large uh, delinquency problem because you can't evict non-paying tenants, et cetera? What are the rent relief programs available there, right? Those are going to be important. Your median household income is way more important than the average income, right? Because uh, you know the difference between median versus average. Uh, median is a much more true representation of the population. Your average can easily be shifted by one millionaire moving in there, right? and shifting the average. So what you wanna do is let's say your highest rent is 1,500 a month times 12 makes it 18,000. You wanna make sure that 18,000 times three, which is 54,000 is the median household income or higher. You don't wanna be lower than that three X factor. Ideally, the higher, the better. Because as you keep trying to increase your rents or other income sources, those tenants who live in that area need to be able to pay for it, right? So you don't want to have 40k median household income if 1500 is your um, average rent at your property crime stats is huge so when i go look at properties i drive by them at night i try to see if i can get down walk around and i feel safe there i listen to the sounds there i try to feel the mood there what kind of things am i smelling there what 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 that whole area looks like is so important. That's why I live around 30 minutes from most of my properties because I can go check on my properties anytime I want. Like right now, you know, it's uh it's gonna be sunset very soon in Dallas. And if there's a problem at one of my properties, I see something on a camera, I can literally hop in my car and drive to a property and come back and without having to worry about it. And that's a huge convenience. Crime is big, right? There's parts of South Dallas where I don't recommend getting a property unless you're used to dealing with that kind of high crime, right? Really ask the sponsorship team if you're gonna raise capital for someone, right? Or if you're gonna invest passively. Do you have experience uh, turning around a property like that, which is full of, you know, drug dealers and I don't know, people with guns and whatever, you know, all kinds of crime issues. Uh, some properties are second chance tenant kind of places, right? If the sponsorship team doesn't have experience dealing with that, and I don't have a lot of experience dealing with D and worse kind of properties, right, which are high in crime, that would be something very difficult for me to make it work and, you know, make money in it. You're going to turn away the tenants that you actually want to invite there, right? I want that single mom with two kids to feel safe living in my property. So that's my demographic, right? So figure out who's your target of TAR or your target resident you want to stay there and make sure not just the apartment complex, but what's around it supports that resident, invites that resident. So we look for families. So uh, most of my apartments are right by a, a school. They're surrounded by single family homes nearby or across the street. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that I look for. Obviously, uh, I know we have somebody from Houston here. How does a floodplain affect your underwriting? In a big way, right? Even in Dallas, I have a property um, that Charles is actually invested in where couple of the buildings are in a floodplain because of the creek running by, and that affects your insurance rates. And so depending on the number of buildings that are in a floodplain, even though normally you don't think of a floodplain typically for Dallas, you think of it more for Houston, uh, that can affect your numbers. So uh, doing a thorough due diligence is so important in your underwriting. So the safest thing to do is provide your address to all these neutral third-party people, like your insurance, right? get an insurance quote from somebody who's familiar with that area. And they'll look into it and tell you, by the way, it's not just two buildings, it's actually seven buildings that are in the flood zone. And this is what is going to be your insurance rate, right? 
And this is how it's going to go up year after year. So plan for this much of an increase, not just an insurance quote for today, but what kind of increases should I anticipate and plan for in the future, right? And you must look for any, um, from the broker, you can ask for the past three years, have they made any claims? Because that's going to affect your insurance rate. Yeah, I could go on and on for this slide. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Let's see. Uh, if I can page down my slide successfully. Okay, yes. This is super important. This is everything. Market analysis of similar vintage properties right near your subject property. So once you have a subject property, you've got to visit these comps, as I call them, competitive analysis. You've got to go visit them personally yourself. I know for a lot of people, you're living in one place, you're investing in a different place. Get somebody local to drive by these properties and truly compare them. Are they really comparable properties? Are they really similar, right? You can't compare your C-class property to an A-class property nearby and say, oh, their rents are $300 more. I could easily bump the rents here. That's probably not realistic comparison. So an apples to apples, a true apples to apples comparison is so important. Do they have similar amenities? Do they have little yards? Do they have balconies? Do the interiors have fireplaces, washer dryer connections? They have a big playground. They have a picnic area. They have basketball court. They have a pool. I mean, what do they have, right? These other comparable properties nearby to be charging either a little more or a little less in rent. Why is my subject property better or worse than those competitive properties? Look at it from the, uh, you know, the eyes of a resident, your avatar, who's going to come and live at your property. Why is one better than the other? What are their, you know, um, application fees, security deposits? All of those add up. Imagine yourself on a shoestring budget. You're trying to afford this place to stay. You've got to live in this location to be near your place of work or school or whatever your criteria. And you're really shopping all these properties. Why would you pick the subject property over the others? What's the subject property doing better or worse than the others? That's what you really need to know, right? You, you can't hide from the truth. Okay, this is why my property is better than that. And this is why my property is not as good as that. And is that something I can overcome? Is that something I cannot? Right? What are they doing better than me? What are they doing worse than me? That's so important to understand that from the point of view of a resident, because only there you can figure out how you can add value. Is it an amenity that the resident is going to pay for? Is it worth an extra 25 bucks because their paint looks slightly better? Or do they look like a drastically different and nicer property? They look amazing, not just from their exterior appearance, but also from the interiors. Maybe their customer service is better. Did you read all those reviews, right? Google reviews online. What do residents who've been there the last six months say about all of these different properties? So what I do is I plan a half day. If I'm very serious, if all the underwriting, everything, the numbers look perfect, and it looks like I want to make an offer on this deal. Oh, this is the best deal since sliced bread. Then I go myself and personally visit every competitive property there. I take Starbucks gift cards with me and I go sit in the offices of the uh, property managers, leasing managers of these other competitive properties. And I wait. I may have to wait 30 minutes before I get a chance to talk to them. Never go to them on the first of the month like today, right? You always want to go mid-month. But you want to go sit there, talk to them, be honest with them about what you're trying to do, which is, hey, I'm looking for properties in this area and I need to know what is competitive and great about your property compared to the others. If you could have $50,000 today, what would you spend it on to improve this property? What is your biggest complaint you're getting from residents? What do you think your property does so much better than that? Oh, uh, you know, Oasis Springs next door. What does your property do better than Woodside Villas next door? You know, things like that. Why, what are some things that differentiate your property? You want to have those conversations with every property manager if you can, and it takes time. For me, it takes two to three full days of doing this because I got to drive there. I got to sit. The timing has to work. I give them a thing and then, you know, take breaks, et cetera. So it adds up. But when I go to visit a property with the broker and I go to tour it with the broker, I try to go a couple of hours earlier so I can at least cover a couple of the neighborhood properties, nearby properties that I've already analyzed from the broker's OM. So what that gives me is already some good talking points with the broker and with the property manager, because that's my one chance to view my subject property, impress a broker with my local knowledge, but also talk to the property manager who's running it right there or the maintenance guy. They'll tell us, okay, 
hmm, I'm seeing, you know, why are there window AC units? Is something not working in, in the AC, right? That's a question. You actually want to visit properties after a rainy day because then you can see where all the puddles are, where the leaks are, where the drainage is not good, et cetera, right? And I try to take somebody, depending on, I scout the property before I'm actually doing an official tour. So I already know what mechanicals I may have concerns with, and I might take a more of an expert with me if needed, right? Maybe uh, the guy who did my recent, I don't know, if it's a chiller property or a HVAC guy or whoever, right, to see. But normally you want to plan for all of the repairs and uh, budget based on a full thorough due diligence. But until recently, it's always been a seller's market the last three years. So you don't really get that inspection period. Your money goes hard day one. So you kind of have to budget for repairs a little bit more than before you truly get into the property and know your actual what your actual costs are going to be. So I try to do as much homework as I can up front before I make offers. And remember, any spreadsheet can be manipulated to show pretty much any returns that you want. You want me to show double returns? You want me to show, you know, 7% cash on cash? You want me to, you know, give you a certain IRR? You know that can be changed, right? Because basically it's just 10 numbers on a spreadsheet. You tweak them and they'll show you anything you want. So it's really the assumptions behind every number you put in there. How can you show me a 10% rent bump? Is that realistic going into 2023? I'm not sure, right? A lot of people are saying rents are going to remain flat. Maybe it's even going to come down. So you really need to know your little pocket market to be able to truly say that. You need to have a property management company who has presence in that lo local market who can say that. And you need to keep a pulse on ever on a weekly basis. Oh, how many renewals are coming up? Are tenants protesting this higher rent? Are you having trouble filling up your vacant units, right? You need to have that regular pulse. So if a property management company has no experience in that market and they want to come in as the first, you know, their, I don't know, first deal in Dallas as an example, and they've only operated in Houston, then I don't think that's a good choice because they don't have a pulse for that little submarket that I need. So here's an example of an initial underwriting on a absolutely random property uh, with some numbers. And what I wanna show between this initial underwriting, right? There's a rent bump assumption, right? You can see it here on the right. It's an overall 13%. If you look at the bottom right of the screen, uh, there is like a 13% overall rent bump. Okay, is that realistic? And an 8% cash on cash, wouldn't that be nice? As you can tell, this is probably an older underwriting sheet. And I kept everything the same, right? You, you remember this 13%, you remember all this stuff. And the only thing I changed was taxes and insurance. And you see how much this changed? The total passive returns are now 80% versus initially it was 112%. And only two numbers were changed, the taxes and insurance. That's in another tab called the expenses tab. And the only thing I modified was those two things. And those can drastically affect your cash on cash and your overall returns. So if somebody is not local to Texas and they don't know how much your taxes can get changed year on year, and they don't fill that out correctly in their underwriting spreadsheet, or they didn't dig in as deeply into insurance as I was pointing out earlier, and they put the wrong numbers, then you know they're going to project this to investors. Hey, I'm going to give you 112% return, when in reality, they'd be lucky to get an 80% return, right? So just two little numbers could change that. Let's see, what do I have here? Oh yeah, business plan, right? You're gonna come up with a business plan. And you're gonna tell your investors, guess what? I'm gonna do these five things and I'm gonna double your money in five years or whatever that number is, right? So you've got to do a cost benefit analysis, right? And think about what kind of a return I'm getting for every dollar that I'm putting into my CapEx plan. Does it really make sense to put more than $10,000 into an interior to get what you hope for as a $75 rent bump. Is that good value for the money? Or does it make sense maybe to spend $3,000 on a washer dryer connection for which you could easily get a $50 rent bump, right? So what's the cost and hassle associated with that? And what's your ROI? Or if they already have washer dryer connections, maybe you just rent washers and dryers, $1,500, and you get 50 bucks for it. Is that better use of your money or the $10,000 fancy interior stainless steel level of upgrade, right? So what is 
like be very careful spending every dime in your property in the coming year because you never know when the delinquency could go up you especially if you're on a floating rate loan your mortgage rate can go up quite a bit if you've not already felt it you'll be feeling it so make sure for every item you put in your business plan is it realistic who is agreeing to this number what is your payback period it's going to take you maybe five years to get your money back on something versus a year or two years like let's say you want to implement wi-fi right you want to get a wi-fi contract or you want to install your own wi-fi at the property you're spending maybe 10k but you're going to get 30 bucks per door per month you've got 100 doors well you know that the payback period on that is going to be a lot faster right than an interior upgrade you're spending ten thousand dollars you're getting a 50 to 75 dollar rent bump in a whole year you're going to make another 600 to 900 dollars right so getting that ten thousand dollars back is going to take you a while versus getting this two or three thousand back from a wi-fi from a washer dryer etc is a lot quicker and those might be things you could do while the unit is occupied versus an interior upgrade is something you cannot do typically till the resident moves out so you've got the move out cost the make ready cost then the upgrade etc so that's not something you can just do overnight so you'll do that over a year's time as and when the units get vacant so really study that business plan closely and say, what am I going to get for the money I'm spending? And is this the best use of money? Because I've got only this one bucket of money to spend for CapEx. And what's the best use of that CapEx money? In fact, you should look at it the way um, I've typically looked at most of my C-class properties, which is what is the minimum I need to do to get my pro forma rent? Right. That's very important. And then um, always have a budget review with property management company. And the numbers that they give you is what you plug into your analyzer spreadsheet. So if property management says this is the cost for payroll. This is your admin expenses. This is what your marketing budget needs to be based on where you're located, right? If you're hidden from the main streets and highways, et cetera, uh, and you're not as visible, you may need to market yourself a little more. You have to spend a little bit more on digital marketing. What are some free sources of marketing? Etc. So that's the kind of conversations you have uh, before you choose a property management company. You interview a couple of property management companies, right? Two or three. And uh, like I have now seven properties in the Dallas area. I have three different management companies because each of them are specialized in one particular location. And I don't want to put all my eggs into one basket. So for me, it's good to diversify in terms of PM companies just in case I need to switch, but also. I like to have a company that already owns and um, already operates a few properties nearby so that if my maintenance guy is out, I can always borrow maintenance and, you know, just be charged a few hours. So there's a lot of benefits if your PM already runs a few properties in that local area. They already are familiar with the demographics, the rents, the movement, the popularity or what is less popular, what people are willing to pay for, et cetera, kind of level. This is physical due diligence. Um, I think most of you know this. I'm not going to elaborate too much on this, but we hire a company to do this for us. Uh, but you basically bring every trade and you inspect everything. This is after you're under contract and you have access to the property. So I will I will share all these slides with anyone who wants it. I'll share it with our meet, meetup host so you don't have to go back. But the biggest thing is once you've done all this analysis, you've got to go back and plug the, any modified numbers into your spreadsheet and see if the numbers still work right? Does it still make sense? And it's very tempting to make the deal work by tweaking numbers in a positive way. So you need a reality check of unbiased people. So several of us here are from the Sumrock group. And what you need is unbiased coaches who own thousands of doors to challenge some of your assumptions and see if the project is realistic. So get somebody who's neutral, who's not part of your prior, you know, um, general partnership team to look at these numbers and see if it's realistic. Are those rent bumps realistic? All those assumptions of other income realistic, et cetera. And the best deal might be the one that you walk away from. So you don't have sleepless nights trying to make it better and suffer through it. Believe me, when you're in a bad deal, I'm in a bad passive deal and even that keeps me up at night. I can't imagine what that would be like if I was in a bad you know, deal where I was the general partner. So uh, this is something I'll just share with you real quick. Not many people are doing bridge loans now. 
But in terms of financial due diligence, there's so many different things you can negotiate. So the one thing we negotiated this year was we did not want to have a yield maintenance type of prepayment penalty. So Fannie and Freddie loans will have a yield maintenance penalty that could be several millions of dollars. So sometimes you can get it into a step down prepayment instead by paying up a little point. Now, of course, you won't have yield maintenance if the potential buyer later assumes your loan, but you don't know that. So you kind of have to assume, OK, nobody's going to assume your loan. It's going to be new debt when you sell it. So you have to pay that prepayment penalty. Most people, when they underwrite deals, they don't account for this. So they just project these phenomenal returns. And I'm like, OK, you sold it for the price you wanted, but you ended up paying $4 million in prepayment penalty. So really, the returns are not what you initially projected investors, right? So you got to keep that in mind. So in four to five years from today, if you plan to sell a deal, but you just got yourself a Fannie or a Freddie loan today, well, those are 10-year terms, most of them, right? Some are seven year, but I've typically seen only 10 year terms. So if you sell in year five, guess what? Then your Freddie has issued these bonds, et cetera, to people promising them that interest for five more years. And you're taking that away from them by closing the deal in five years. So the balance five years worth of interest, somebody has to pay it. And that's what you will end up paying as a yield maintenance penalty. And most people don't include this when they think of the, their underwriting. They assume, oh, somebody's going to assume my loan or somehow it's going to evaporate. Well, it doesn't evaporate and come and hits you when you sell the deal in less than the you know 10 year term that you had projected so don't forget yield maintenance prepayment penalty um there's extension fees for bridge loans etc those are all things you can negotiate so bridge lending is the wild wild west pretty much everything is negotiable uh these days lenders have the upper hand you as a syndicator are at their mercy so be cautious, try to go with fixed rate loans, go with loans that are more predictable. We paid extra to lock in our rates early in the cycle of our deals when we got them under contract this last, this year in the last six months, just because the Fed went nuts after April. Um, rate caps are extremely expensive. Bridge lanes, I think bridge loans right now are so expensive. I don't think anybody's doing them anymore. Most people are returning to agency loans with lower leverage. So capital is going to be a big one. OK, so what's a value add deal that is stabilized, that is not distressed, that is supposed to be conservative underwriting? So these are the kind of deals that I buy. I buy deals that have a high occupancy. They are stabilized already, so they qualify for an agency loan. That means they're already 90% occupied for the last 90 days. And that's what a Fannie or a Freddie looks at to call it a stabilized deal that they will loan to. They don't care if my actual delinquency is, uh, you know, a humongous number. They don't care about that um, economic occupancy. They just care about the physical occupancy. So physically, do I have 90 warm bodies in there, you know, out of 100? And that's what they look for. Uh, typically, I try not to buy deals which have too many down units. It's hard to get those up. You know, your seller might give you a small concession for them. And there's a reason why they are still down units. Um, I get deals that have several different ways that I can add value so that if one, you know, prong doesn't work, then I have a couple of other ways to do it. Um, you have to be very flexible in your strategies. And uh, when you want to actually exit the deal, you've got to have multiple options, right? So you may have to hold the deal longer. So this is the risk with bridge loans. A lot of people got into bridge deals, let's say two or three years ago. This was the magical year that they should have done their refi, right? You see so many people include a refi in their underwriting. Have you noticed that? Guess what? I'm going to buy a deal today. And in year two or year three, I'm going to refi it because the interest rate is going to be just perfect for me. And it's, uh, this Fed's going to make the special deal for me to give me a really nice, cute, low interest rate so I can refi whenever I want. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. So you cannot include a refi in your underwriting. It's a nice bonus to have, but if you already plug it in there in your year two or year three, you don't know that. You don't know that the year is gonna be perfect for a refi, so don't include it. Don't include that in your spreadsheet. It's just a bonus to have. And so if somebody has an underwriting where they are planning for a refi, they're like, why would you not plan for a refi? Well, because, you know, that's a gamble. You don't know if it's going to come true. Um, some of my underwriting assumptions, always a very high economic vacancy in year one, meaning you're not going to collect as much as you hope to collect. That's the reality of it. You're taking over a property. You may have to do some, you know, 
uh, turning of those uh, residents, they may not all be good apples that you want to stay there. They'll have some non-paying residents because when a seller is trying to sell a deal, they're going to try to keep it occupied so that the loan goes through so that you end up buying it. So you might inherit some bad apples that you have to get rid of. So at least in year one, as you try to buy and stabilize a deal and implement your business plan, you want to assume a I'm higher economic. This nigga ass. What? You may want to just mute yourself, whoever that is. Do it again. Do it again. Okay, who is Darren? Can you please mute him? <laughs> I don't know who that was. <laughs> uh, continue. I removed him. Go ahead. Um, all expenses and your pro forma, everything has to be verified by a third party property manager who's on board with your business plan. And uh, you've got to make sure your exit cap, which is the cap rate at which you're going to sell the property, is higher than the cap rate at which you're purchasing the property, right? In other words, you're going to assume that the conditions are worse in a few years when you're getting ready to sell than assuming that it's the same or better, right? If you thought about it last year, cap rates, at least in Dallas, were in the range of four cap. Today, it's more like five and a half, six cap if you want to sell something. So it's a worse market today to sell than it was a year ago. I think we all know that because the interest rates went up, so did the cap rates. So you got to make sure in your underwriting that the exit cap is always greater than the entry cap. And I recommend at least, you know, a half a point or so for every year of hold period. So if you're getting it for a six cap today, I know it's hard. Might have to put a seven and a half cap or so eight cap or something in, in a few years to sell it. That's just being extra conservative and see if the deal still works. Um, if people, if some of the worst predictions come true, right, which is rents are going to stay flat or even come down, can your deal handle it, right? I don't mean to scare you, but at the same time, if you have enough wiggle room in your deal, it's nice because then you're less stressed about it next year. And at least for me, it's large deals with other people's money that I can't pay back. So the deal has to work and pay them back. And so if I'm making decisions on the deal, uh, they better be good decisions, right? So moving on to, I think I had a title. Yes, asset management. If anyone has any comments on some of the things I said, I, I've been talking continuously. So feel free to add them in the chat box, interrupt me, et cetera. But yes, moving on to just a quick question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, you know, if you, the comment about the cap rate, uh -huh. my understanding was that the cap rate does not include the principal and interest. Could you explain what you meant when you said uh, the six and a half cap rate was not as good as the four? I said that market cap. So cap rate is the rate at which uh, your uh, property could get sold. So it's based on the net operating income. So your revenue minus your operating expenses is your net operating income of a property. Mm -hmm. And that's before you pay your debt service. So your NOI divided by the price you're paying for the property, that equals your entry cap or purchase cap. Right. Uh, wouldn't, uh, so you're saying a higher number? A higher is... cap rate, like points like a six cap versus a four cap, the higher the cap rate, the lower the value of your property. So you're assuming worse market conditions in five years by assuming a higher cap rate at the time of sale compared to at the time of purchase. So entry cap is lower than exit cap. Gotcha. Okay. I was, yeah, that's, that's the same comment. I was, so that is assuming that the NOI remains the same and your uh, asset value has gone down because of your market conditions, right? Well, NOI, hopefully you'll increase it, but you got to <laughs> yeah. increase it at a faster rate if your exit cap is going up, right? Because right gotcha. now from last year to this year, your interest rates went up. So the purchasing power of a potential buyer of your property right now their purchasing power just went down because interest rates went up. So you are selling your property at a higher cap rate or a slightly lower value today than a year ago. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, sure. So Thanks. from an asset manager, go ahead. Was somebody Sorry. saying something? Yes, yes I did. Uh, this is Ingrid. I had a quick question, and this was on the slide before, and it was regarding the underwriting. And I think you brought a really good point about how we, sh uh, like, doing the refinance mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. that should be owned pretty much. Because, like, I have seen a lot of syndications, and I want to make sure that I'm understanding this, this correctly. I see a lot of uh, GPs doing, like, a refinance in year three, four, or five, and the main motivation is for them to give the money back to the LPs. Correct. But it makes Correct. me think also that is also because they have a bridge loan. And that's why they want to refinance. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Two reasons. Mm -hmm. so you don't know the terms of their bridge loan. Typically, a bridge loan is three years plus one plus one. Three one one is the most typical bridge loan we've seen. There are other structures as well. So if you are approaching 36 months, let's say you're at two and a half years now, and in three years, your bridge loan comes to an end, the lender can choose not to extend it. Okay. So you have to have a very good financials to present to them so that they can extend it for you by another year. They don't have to. And so that's why most people who get a bridge loan, a bridge uh, by its name implies that it's a temporary bridge to a permanent loan. Mm-hmm. And so people can plan for it. I also have deals on bridge loans, but I don't include that upside from a refi in my underwriting. Because when you do a refi, you're returning a portion of the capital. Maybe it's 30%, maybe it's 50%, maybe it's more. And if conditions are favorable, like a year ago, interest rates were really low. So you could refi into a nice you know, 4% kind of interest rate loan. If you wanted to refi today, what are you gonna refi it into? your existing bridge rate might be better than what you're going to refi into today, right? Yeah. So it's not a guarantee is what I'm saying. So even though you can have it in the back of your mind as a great idea to actually take a number and say, I will refi in year three and return 50% of investors' capital, it may not work mm -hmm. because interest rates may not be there. So you can't plan for it as a sure bet and put it in an underwriting, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that it's makes very sense. speculative. Yeah, that makes sense. And I always wonder how they know they're going to refine year three, four, or five. But if they decide, say that they they decide to do the underwriting because now they have an agency loan secure. Mm -hmm. In that case, does that does this mean that they won't be able to return most of the money of the LPs? I mean, they have monthly, I mean, a yearly cash flow and returns, but Correct. the majority of it won't happen until the exit of the deal at the end of the cycle. Typically, right, agencies don't let you exit easily. Every year, there's a prepayment penalty that keeps going down. You can buy it down by getting a step down, but agency loans don't have a free exit or a low-cost exit. Bridge loans have a free exit. Some bank loans have a free exit or a low-cost exit, right? So mm -hmm. every loan is so different. You have to know that if I get a Fannie Mae loan today for 10 years and I want to sell my deal in five years, well... There's a prepayment penalty you have to pay mm. for exiting in year five instead of waiting till year 10. Because all that interest that was promised to Fannie and Fannie that it promised to its investors is not there because you're suddenly finishing the loan. You know, you can pay off your car loan anytime you want and there's no prepayment penalty. But there is a prepayment penalty when it comes to agency loans because the yeah. government takes it and issues bonds and stuff with it. So um, it's more like a, it's like a long term play then with an agency loan. Correct. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Loan that's considered permanent loan. That's why bridge is temporary. It's a bridge to permanent financing. Agency loans are usually 10 years. So you have to look at the terms and you have to look at how can you exit. If I want to exit in three years, you should be talking to your lender. I'm getting a deal today. I'm going to exit it in three years. What is the best loan for me? Okay. What kind of an exit should I plan for this loan? It's a very okay. important conversation to have with your lender. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Because you don't know that the buyer wants to assume your loan, right? Because today, if you're getting a loan, it may be a higher interest rate than in three years. So your buyer in three years may not want to take the loan from today. In 2025, most people predict the, low, the interest rates to be the same or less. So they'd rather get new debt than assume your debt because the IO period is less. Right? Yep. Thank you. Sure. Um, in terms of um, asset management, your KPIs are still the same. It's your basics of revenue, your top line revenue collections. 
You've got to have one number for that. And that's the target that I give all my property managers every month is I want my top line revenue to be at least 120K as an example on one of my deals or 160K, right? Because that's a number nobody can fudge. Nobody can cheat. Nobody can change it saying I'm doing this kind of accounting or I forgot to put in this expense, et cetera. So when you pay base things on the NOI, a lot of times they won't include certain expenses. Like if a vendor came and you know did some work and they said, oh, the, I don't know, landscape maintenance. I didn't pay for that this month. We'll just pay two of those bills next month so that I can make my NOI look really nice for this month, right? But your top line revenue, nobody can cheat that number. So we always emphasize that number and we always base any kind of incentives to our local property management staff on that number, right? And then um, really understanding what is a below the line expense. A below the line expense means it goes below the NOI. The NOI is the one that's the most important factor in deciding the value or purchase price of your property, right? NOI divided by the cap rate. That's the number your brokers look at, that's the number you look at, that's the number your lender looks at, et cetera. What is the NOI? So if you had a one-time expense from a plumbing leak or you replaced an air conditioner, et cetera, those are all examples of operating expenses, but that are below the line. So they really shouldn't be counted towards the NOI. So if your property manager gives you a monthly statement that includes some of these expenses that are one-time expenses, that are not normal day-to-day -day operations recurring expenses every month, right? Like a tree fell, so we had to haul it off, et cetera. That's a one-time expense versus, okay, we're mowing the lawn. You know, that's a monthly maintenance expense. So you want to make sure below-the-line expenses are correctly classified. Um, you want to make sure all your incentives for any of your property staff are based on things that nobody can fudge or change just so that they get their bonus. So we place more emphasis on renewals than on new leases. Why do you think that is? Put it in the chat box for me. Why are renewals are more important than new leases? Or if somebody wants to speak up, now is a good time. They cost less. Yeah. Why do they cost less, Charles? You don't have to do uh, you don't have to remodel the place. The person takes it pretty much as is, or you may mm -hmm. offer them a few little things if you want to put a bit more money. Yeah. So we've been offering to su supply our residents who we like on our renewal list with a new fan, a new appliance, or maybe they're going away for a weekend and will come in and do a fresh coat of paint or just replace a bathtub or things like that. Uh, we've been trying to do that to incentivize residents to say, um, our current renewal rate, we're trying to target a minimum of 60% and ideally closer to 75 to 80%, especially through the lean season. The holidays is when the least number of people move. So one thing you might see generally in the news is that, oh, rents are all coming down. Well, if you look at history, this is the time, all the historical data will tell you that around the holidays is when, if you had to offer a concession, et cetera, this is when you have the least amount of traffic. This is the off peak season, right? Your April, May, June, July, August, all of that is your peak leasing season. Now is your off peak season. So you may have to offer concessions, et cetera. So this is the time that we try to stretch it by offering um, renewals at a reasonable rate. Or if they say, oh, they protest the rent too much, right? Say, oh, you can't increase it by $200. That's so much. I've lived here five years. Like, all right, let's only give you this much of an increase. I'll give them a $50 less or something, right? So instead of increasing their rent by 100, I may only increase it by 50. And I may say, let's stretch this by six months. Let's do a six month lease. And my so called loss of revenue is 50 bucks a month for six months, which is nothing. When you compare to the cost of them vacating the unit, me making that unit ready, maybe having to do some repairs and upgrades that I wouldn't otherwise have to do, then signing a new lease and credit checks and all that of the new tenant, right? So you got to look at, even if I'm leasing this unit at about $50 less than my pro forma rent, my impact for an entire year is only $600. A typical make ready is going to cost me at least 1000 bucks. 1500 maybe 2000 Maybe I'll find something broken. I'll have to spend even more to fix it, right? Versus if the resident stays, that's what I want. So renewals should be a huge focus as you go into a recession, as you go into these challenging times. If you can pull up that list, we review the list of renewals in our weekly calls. Okay, how many renewal notices did you send out? 
how many are you renewing? I'm like, why are you not renewing those three tenants? Oh, they're always noisy and disturbing the place. I said, are they paying their rent on time? Okay, why don't you just go issue a couple of lease violations, tell them to keep it down? Because if they're paying on time, they're a little bit noisy. That's different from being a drug dealer and not paying rent, you know? So, you know, let's make sure we keep the tenants we want to keep going into a lean season and going into a so-called recession. Let's not spend all that extra capex right now. If we can kick the can down the road by six months or longer, that's what we need to be doing. The next thing is any kind of make ready, right? Let's say you have 10 vacant units and you only have two move-ins next week. Do I really have to have all 10 units made ready by tomorrow? Do I really have to hire a bunch of contractors and get it all ready by tomorrow? No, we just have to look at, at what rate is my property manager leasing the units? What are those move-in dates? Let's make sure the units are ready by those move-in dates. Let's also stagger leases when we do new leases. Does every lease have to be 12 months? Can it be 13 months or 11 months? Can it all be ending in a peak season rather than a lean season? Don't have renewals ending around Christmas. That's painful. That's a time when you can't really get people to work. Nobody's going to move out of that time. So look at your leases and stagger those renewals. Let's not have 10 units all coming, you know, off their lease at the same time. That's too many make readies to do. So think of it from a make ready standpoint when you do these leases. Think of it from a move out hassles and high vacancy standpoint. Like your lender doesn't like to see too many vacant units, right, in your property. So you want to keep that occupancy number really high at all times. So stagger those leases, negotiate things. I, we had a student who said she was very unhappy that her rent has gone up by so much and she only needs the apartment for four more months. So you know what we said? We said, we'll get you a bargain. We'll, instead of increasing your rent by 200, we'll just increase it by 100. You just stay for four months. So we just signed a four month lease with her as an exception clause, as a student discount. So she was out by the you know beginning of June, she was gone. And June is a peak season for us and we leased it back. So we weren't tied to her for a whole year either. So make sure you follow fair housing rules. So you've got to make the offer available. Like you can change the rules between your unit types, but like all your two twos, anybody leasing it or renewing it should have the same rules. And same with you know your unit types. So the way you can distinguish is, oh, it's harder for me to lease the one bedroom. So maybe those I can offer a better incentive versus my two bedrooms. Oh, they're all gone in a second because all families love those two bedrooms, right? So you can, again, uh, offer more incentives also to your leasing personnel to say, put more clause in there in terms of don't, you don't get your bonus if we figure out that the person didn't pass credit check and you just let them in anyway to get your bonus, right? Because leasing agents can do that. It can be very tempting for them to earn that $100 by letting the wrong people in. So you gotta keep a close watch on those kind of things, but keep the lease term in mind, focus really a lot on re renewals, um, see if you can do everything in-house, your make readies, even your upgrades, et cetera, as much as possible in-house with your maintenance salaries. It's much cheaper than hiring outside contractors or just giving it to a company and say, oh, come and make this unit a uh, perfectly upgraded unit because any contract company is gonna come and charge a fortune, right? What are your sources of other income? Don't forget to you know, find those hidden pennies in the couch, as I call them, right? You might say trash and pest control is only $5, but that's $5 times, at least in my case, 100 or 200 units, it adds up fast. That's thousand bucks a month, you know, times 12, 12,000 bucks a month. On a five cap, that's 240K increase in value. You know, that's from $5, right? So those $5 can go a long way. Um, the other sources of other income, I love Wi-Fi. Now, parking, right? A lot of people in their initial underwriting, they say, I'm going to get, I'm going to charge 50 bucks for reserved parking. Well, if you did your due diligence and drove around that place and think of yourself as a resident, would you pay 50 bucks to park there? Is there plenty of parking already available? Do people do reserved parking in those areas? Is this apartment and the next door apartment, et cetera, is reserved parking a common thing? So don't just assume that, just because it looks perfect on paper and the broker said so, you can charge 50 bucks for reserved parking. Maybe quite unrealistic. So parking is an income that I do count on only later. After I purchase the property, I do a survey of the residents to see if that's something they would like. So for example, Charles is involved in this Woodgate Apartments in Garland. 
now that we've owned it for some time, we've done our rubs for electricity, we've implemented a lot of our rent increases. Now we did a survey of the residents and some of them asked for reserved parking. So now we're starting to implement that. So we charge an extra 25 or 50 bucks and all we have to do is put a stripe there and put it as reserved and then that parking number, the spot number, and that's it. Covered parking is a whole different beast. A lot of people love to have covered parking, but it costs you more. It involves permits, involves construction, et cetera. So it's a more elaborate process and they may or may not allow it. So it, it, you know, you've got to check with your city. So it's not something you can just put in your underwriting without ever checking with the city, you know, up front. So look for the stories that are realistic. Make sure a property management company buys the story and believes in those numbers. Um, like right now, budgets are starting to come out for 2023 across all my properties. And a lot of PMs are saying, I don't know that I can increase the rent that much. Maybe it's only 50 or 25, not 200, right? Now that we're going to another year. So you've got to make sure that your property manager agrees with the rent numbers you have and you can do, get a pulse on it. So I help, I have a few friends who will go secret shop properties for me. So I just pay them to make phone calls say, you know, my daughter is moving here, that kind of a story, and they'll secret shop. And they'll find out what these units are actually renting for and what concessions some places are offering. If you move in by this weekend, we'll give you $100 off and this and this and this, right? You need to know that because that's your competition doing that. So in that case, if you're not doing that, you're less, you know, they may just go to the other property and you have a vacant unit. So if I could just get somebody in because of a move-in special, 50 bucks off or free Wi-Fi or something, Think of your cost of even a month's worth of rent. That's $1,500. Can I just give them free Wi-Fi for a month and, and get them in? It's worth it, right? So in winter and lean season especially, you got to be creative in your offers. You got to use your digital marketing. Facebook Marketplace is a free source. Create a fake account there. List your property there. Sell a unit there if you have an occupancy issue, right? So monthly pet rent is huge, right? So one of the things you've got to do is audit, do a pet audit. So one of the things you've got to do is whenever filters are changed, that's an easy time. Tell your maintenance, go change filters. Tell me when you change filters last. That's one of the best ways to maintain your air conditioning system is by changing filters. Go change the filters and tell me if you noticed a pet. Easy peasy. Second opportunity whenever pest control comes. So again, ask maintenance. Pest control is here. They're going to do building page. Go and tell me how many pets are there. Then match it against your records and see if there's pet rent. Because there's pet deposit that's non-refundable, and then there's pet rent as well. I discovered about 23 pets that were not in the rent roll uh, when I did a sort of an audit and inspection of unit box uh, recently in one of my properties. 23 pets. Even at 20 bucks, 25 bucks a piece, you know, it adds up, you know, talking 500 a month times 12, but then the pet deposits, right? Those are one time non-refundable pet deposits of 100 each. You know, that's a nice two grand, right? So uh, reserve parking and pet rent are some of the uh, cheapest things to do. Yes, pet deposits are very much legal, as Angel can attest to. We collect them. I see it. It's not legal. I can't believe three different PMs would collect it across all properties. So yes, um, at one point, I think for COVID, they were trying to say that it's a mental health support pet or something, but all that is gone. So now we can actually charge for it. So asset management today is all about being very careful with your money. Be tight with your spending. Um, like when I moved to this country, my first uh, week, it was a long time ago, my food budget was $8 a week. That doesn't seem like much money at all. But if you spend your money in the property carefully, like it was your own money coming out of your own pocket, and just treat that money carefully, like why is tree trimming going to cost me 1600 bucks? Maybe it could be done for 700 right? It's just an example of an expense. When it's a property manager, they don't care. And they're spending other people's money. It's like the government saying, oh, I'm going to take all your money and I'm going to use it for this instead of this. Well, it's not their own personal money. Why do they care? Right? It's just other people's money that they're spending. So your PM, your property manager, your uh, maintenance, et cetera, they're not going to have the same 
attitude towards spending that investor money and your money um, the same way that you do. So there has to be some level of checks and balances, right? You don't want to micromanage every tiny expense, but at the same time, if your mortgage went up like mine did on some of my properties by 20, 30, $40,000 a month, and it's eating into all my profits, well, um, I could get into a situation where one large expense and I could be in a negative cash flow situation, right? Because all it takes is one big leak, $10,000 worth, and then all these 600, 700 I could have saved each month add up, you know? So you want to put your property management on alert that we're in a con uh, conservative spending mode, only as needed spending. We're not going to spend money on things that don't have an immediate ROI. We're going to wait out the winter. We're going to spend a little more next March. That's kind of like the general message we have told all of our PMs. Because we could have a Texas freeze, we could have pipes burst, we don't know what issues we could have in the next six months. So winter is our lean season. So our spending also is lean at that time. Hope that gives you some ideas for asset management or things that I'm doing across properties. Here's how you can find me. And I'm here to answer questions or hear more ideas from others. Sandeya, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. I got a, a whole lot out. I'm not yeah, I, I can email the slides to everybody. And Angel, please uh, yes, share please, your wisdom. Please do. Please email it to me. Yeah. Uh, Angel, go ahead, Angel. I'm like, yeah. this, this is so, yeah. So mine's, I guess it's kind of a question in a statement. I know you visit your properties a lot. And so when I was on site at our property while Jason and Julian were gone this past summer, the chain of command broke and all of a sudden they're texting me and it, it damaged my, my relationship with the regional. We had to repair that. It was not a conversation I enjoyed. Um, but it, we repaired it, but how do you visit your properties and not have that chain of command broken to where now they're texting you instead of text, instead of texting the regional or contacting the regional? I always inform the full chain of command. So for me, it's a director and then a regional, and I tell them what I'm going to visit the property. Or if I happen to visit it without telling them, I immediately send them an email while I'm in the car in the property and say, hey, I happen to be driving by here. I had something going on, so I'm stopping by and this is all I'm checking. But I make sure I don't make any decisions or direct the property manager in any way. I say, I'm here. I'm going to check on a couple of things. I'm going to leave. So it's more of an information. I don't tell them, hey, let's change the rent by 25 bucks. Hey, let's offer this concession. I don't do any of those conversations. Those are only done through the official channels during our weekly property management calls. That's super important. Mm -hmm. And then if it broke, if I ended up talking about something directly with one of the staff members, I'm immediately texting or informing the regional and the director, hey, this is what I did. Because the rare time that I didn't, oh, they were mad, right? They get upset. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not fun. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions was regarding um, delinquency, I think. Uh, what am I doing to address delinquency? Um, I think the biggest thing you can do is if you inherited a huge delinquency, right? You make a list of those units and you take the, you know, uh, I guess the impact of it right away in your numbers and you start chasing them. You ask for a weekly detailed delinquency plan. So if I have $40,000 as an example in delinquency at a property, and that's across, I don't know, 70 different units, we look at that list every week and we look at the plan. So I need to know anybody that's owing anything that's close to a month's rent, we attack those first. Anything that's like in the range of below 200 or 300 bucks, I don't care. But I care about all the ones because if you're already behind by a month's worth of rent, you're probably not going to catch up. So you need to find another accommodation. It doesn't look like you can afford this property or you want to work hard to pay this property, right? So you've got to do the tough job, which is your property manager has to be strong in issuing notices. So what we do, we have a lot of different hid hidden ways. 
by the fourth of the month, you're due for rent. And if you've not paid it, we start leaving notices on your door. So it's like a pink slip or a blue slip. And all it says is, please, please come see the office. But residents know, they'll be like, oh yeah, that guy, he sneaked in at 10 p.m. I know he's there. He's in the unit, he's trying to leave early. So we get information from neighbors, et cetera. So the property manager builds a strong relationship with the community. So I'm big on communities. I always do some community activity. So then my property manager already has a very strong relationship and connection with most of the residents. Then we build what is, feels like a neighborhood cul-de-sac kind of thing. And everybody tells on everybody, but everybody also knows everybody, right? So for example, we do popsicles by the pool. It's a very inexpensive thing to do in the summer, right? Popsicles are some of the cheapest things you can buy. But you do popsicles by the pool. Mother's Day, we handed a single long term rose to every mom in the apartment complex. So, you know, the Carrollton VDLC property, which was this ugly red paint color that we repainted in these gorgeous Dallas Cowboys theme colors. Um, that one, um, you know, that's what we did. We handed out a rose. And so it builds a relationship. It builds that friendship. And then we hear about the residents who try to sneak in at night and who owe us rent. And then, you know, you got to have a property manager who's on the ball, who's knocking those doors, et cetera, by the fifth and sixth of the month, you know, and you have a promise to play pen. And so every week when they know the owners are going to ask for this information and they have to prepare that report, it makes them take action. Oh, tomorrow's the weekly call. I better go alert these. I better go knock and have an answer. Why since last week, this tenant owes, you know, $2,000 plus, you know, that's a big sum of money. And that's how they know that this property management company is not going to let you get by. You have to have a plan. And the other thing is rent relief, right? Some people actually come and tell us, look, I'm helpless and I can't pay, et cetera. Well, you help them fill out applications, right? You're not just a horrible mean landlord, but at the same time, if you want to have dinner at a steakhouse and what you can really afford is a McDonald's, I mean, we, we need to go find that McDonald's or make food at home. You can't afford a steakhouse every day. I mean, that's the reality of it, right? My, my apartment right now might be a steakhouse for you and you could afford it when your income increases again or, or you know, you have a spouse also working or something. I don't know what that is, but we're not the right fit if paying one month's rent is difficult for you. Mm. Sandeya, I want to say thank you for the great presentation. Thank you for adding so much value.